everyone, my name is Ronella Hernandez and welcome to this episode of Web3 Talks. Joining me today is a special friend of mine, Sandra. Hello, how are you today? Hey Ronella, how are you? <laughs> Sandra is the GCC lead at Zilliqa and also yep. the CEO of Metaminds. Yep. You are a lady of many, many hats. And many, many, many hats. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get into it. But first, I wanted just to ask you how you got into blockchain in the first place. Like, what do you have like a, a memory or a moment that you remember that stands out to you that was like, I need to be in this industry? Honestly, yeah, there were probably two pivotal moments in my personal career that kind of pushed me towards the, the blockchain. Um, I guess my own personal background is a bit interesting because I started off doing something completely different, which was uh, uh, international business and law degree. Mm. But deep down, what I really wanted to do was marketing and advertising. So I kind of pivoted um, to my parents' uh, disapproval <laughs> into what I wanted to do. No, actually, they were very supportive and very, very kind of welcoming of the idea to follow my dreams. But what happened was yeah. I pivoted into marketing and advertising. And then I was pretty lucky because that was kind of at the intersection where everything traditional was going digital. Okay. So in this was like what year? I'm really bad with numbers and I'm really bad with memory <laughs> remembering. But it was at the year where everything traditional was going digital. Okay, okay, <laughs> so okay. It was around that year. Um, so by the time that I had kind of gone through, I went to a private academy as well, which meant that we did it wasn't like a normal university. It was you did a lot of different courses mm -hmm. that kind of treated you as if you were already in the company or in a company. Oh. Um, so it was pretty exciting and pretty interesting to do that. Uh, a part of it was a digital tech class. So what ended up happening was I got more excited about how the future is going to be impacted by tech. And then from that, I got my first job, which was at uh, Lonely Planet. Um, and through Lonely Planet, God, it's a very long story, but <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of given you like this entire, I've kind of got, gotten myself into this entire story. Yeah. Anyways, the two points are um, just throughout my journey, there were a couple of, uh, there was one mentor called Genevieve Laville, um, probably pronounced her name wrong, but she kind of was pretty pivotal in being like, you know, um, I was kind of doing a startup back then. She said to me, you should look into blockchain and be in it. Mm -hmm. But during that same moment, uh, I had already dabbled into the blockchain and was already doing stuff in it, but not really taking it seriously. Like, like as I an was, investor? Not as an investor, but more as in, um, I was kind of advising people to enter blockchain, what NFTs could be, oh, um, okay. how they can apply it in okay. their business, um, what does it mean to kind of look at blockchain and how that would look like in terms of authentication or uh, as a layer of kind of proof, proof of a service, proof of, you know, whatever it is now. And, uh, but I wasn't really taking it seriously because I think I was way too focused on other points of my life and then uh, yeah so it just kind of like transitioned into what it is now and then how did you end up at Zilliqa so Zilliqa is another funny story so <laughs> I I was already a fan of Zilliqa so I was Zilliqa launched in 2017 from uh, Singapore and around 2018 was when I started to pay attention to what Zilliqa was doing so I was already a member of community and I was following them pretty closely on everything that was happening because I was like I said a member of the community and then I also can't remember the date, but there was a moment where I believe I reached out and I was like, you know, there's a couple of things that Zilliqa can do differently that will make it stand oh, okay, out. Okay. And uh, yeah, I just, we you had a conversation. advise them. <laughs> I didn't want to advise them. I just wanted to have a chat with them because I was a member of the community. And I'm like, guys, you know, you, you can probably pay a lot more attention to this. And I remember at that same time, I believe they were discussing about bringing more people internally. So we ended up getting on a call and I spoke with the kind of the, the team there and uh, yeah they, they gave me an offer and were like do you want to join and that kind of kicked off the journey okay awesome yeah. so then how did that lead to what you do now what are your your roles well my roles now are kind of pretty broad but also pretty strategic so uh, give me like a day to day day to day I can't what give you a day to day do <laughs> my day doesn't end you know <laughs> there's there's no weekend or weekday it's just like day <laughs> <laughs> it's a non-ending. Um, I guess you could say my my biggest focal point as CEO of MetaMinds is how to kind of expand and grow the company and make sure that the whole team is understanding the vision and following through with what we want and need to achieve. Okay. Can it's, you give us a little brief of what MetaMinds is? Yeah, I mean, we're a metaverse and a spatial web company. So what we do is we help uh, onboard B2B clients into the metaverse easily okay. uh, and swiftly. We pay a lot of attention to the safety and security of what it means to have an identity in the metaverse. Mm. Uh, we operate through white label solutions, meaning we tailor and customize your metaverse based on the client's needs. It's not like an open world where you come in, 
you build and then you deploy. Okay. Uh, and then we also are working on our product line for the metaverse, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so that's from a metaverse side. But the other part of what I do is I'm helping Zilliqa kind of expand into the GCC region and kind of uh, grow as well the team, grow our, um, I guess you could say, service offering and also just expand regionally. All right, let's take the first part of what you said and break that down a little bit. You mentioned the term spatial web. Yeah. So what exactly does that mean? In your own words. Yeah, good question. Because <laughs> I think a lot of people, you know, when Apple came out with the with the Vision Pro, everyone yeah. was calling, you know, everyone was referencing spatial computing. For me, I've always believed that the next iteration of what the internet is now is going to be, you know, some people are calling it the 3D internet. Um, some people are referring to it as the next layer of engagement. Some people are calling it the metaverse. Yeah. Everyone has like a definition of it. For me, I've always seen it as the spatial web, which is when everything is connected in a way where AR, VR, Metaverse, blockchain, um, tokenization, assets, mm. identity, all kind of are interconnected between the physical and the digital. Okay. So it's the connection between what is real, so in the real world, and what is digital and Mixed how that realities. transition happened. Basically. Kind of, yeah. It's a bit more technical though around how they all work together. But for me, I'm kind of personally not looking at them as a product of their own. So to me, AI isn't AI by itself. It's how can AI benefit VR or how can AI benefit mm. AR or how can they work together? Okay, but then you, you split metaverse and spatial web. So is it not the same thing? The reason we do that is because of how the market is accepting the, <laughs> the acronyms and the titles okay. that are being used right now. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, our core service offering is a metaverse as a service platform. So by saying that we are a metaverse company, but spatial web is pretty big into what we do. Okay, and what does it mean to be a metaverse company? It means nowadays? that we <laughs> it means that we are building the future of what the metaverse or the spatial web is going to be for the next layer of the internet. And what do you hope it will look like? Uh, what do I hope it will look like? Good question. Without trying to sound like I want to take over the world, um, <laughs> do you? I think. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, if, if given the opportunity, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I think for us, the, the metaverse and spatial web kind of intersect between having users that don't feel like they're interacting with blockchain or with technology that they're not kind of very familiar with. Mm -hmm. So working on the customer journey, on the user experience, on what the interface looks like and kind of what it means to onboard mass users without them feeling like they're making a big change in their day to day. Okay. Already we're used to having multiple, I guess you could say, identities online from our Instagram to yeah. our WhatsApp, to our TikToks, to Snapchat, to Facebook, to, what is it called, Spotify, <laughs> to all these other accounts. That, Too many. <laughs> yeah, so to add another layer, it can get a bit complicated. So what we're looking at doing is building the operating system for the interoperability, the safety and security, where users don't need to constantly be changing their identity, their assets and their kind of means of operating in a space. And are these spaces and, and metaverse platforms that you're building built on Zilliqa blockchain? So for the metaverse to be functional, it doesn't need a blockchain. It needs kind of more, I guess you could say, NVIDIA Omniverse, Unity, uh, Unreal, and for some other graphics. technology, yeah, more for the graphics. Yeah. Zilliqa comes in at the layer where it looks at identity, at NFT minting. So everything okay. that has to do with asset ownership and minting, we plug into the Zilliqa blockchain layer. And what would be the advantages of using the Zilliqa blockchain layer versus Ethereum? Good question again. Uh, you know, the Zilliqa blockchain layer is uh, pretty sustainable. A lot of people now are talking about sustainability. The fact that it operates at a lower cost fee means that we are able to mint a large amount at a low base. So you're not really paying that much for minting or for asset ownership. Mm -hmm. um, we have our own smart contract language called Scylla, which... Uh, Scylla? Scylla, yeah. <laughs> Unless I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm pretty sure it's Scylla. <laughs> uh, which is pretty safe, smart and secure. So it means that it's it's very hard to kind of break into or, or, or break um, in terms of hacking. Mm -hmm. So from that end, it's very secure. Um, Zilliqa is doing quite a lot as well, like I said, with being sustainable. We recently actually launched, launched a partnership with GMX and 013 around how, as a user, you can offset the purchases that you make from a brand okay. and you can put some of this loyalty into initiatives. So how you can, so for example, you purchase something on, on in, I don't know, any brand, pick a brand. Um, but in the metaverse? No, no, or? in physical world. Oh, okay. In a physical okay. world, right? <laughs> I don't know, you went to your favorite store, you purchased a handbag. Um, yeah. They say to you, you know, this totals to, let's say, 300 uh, tokens 
to offset the carbon that was done. What happens then is you would tap into the platform that we are launching mm -hmm. and there would be a certain number of initiatives. So it could be, I don't know, um, reforestation, reforestation. Yeah. <laughs> um, Reforestation, I think. I don't know, uh, something else, whatever. And then you can pick what you want and you okay. can kind of just put it towards there. So mm, okay. we're looking at doing quite a lot around that area. Okay. Silica so has a lot of benefits too, to be honest. As a, It was the first blockchain that introduced sharding before sharding was even a thing, uh, before Ethereum kind of picked it up and wanted to do it. Can you just so. explain what that is? Another one line. <laughs> Honestly, no. No. Okay. <laughs> I, I could, but then I would need to get extremely technical, and then yeah. I would just really have to break it down, it's and it would term. just, uh, yeah, the, the whole episode would just go to me okay. explaining sharding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No worries. And so let's get into some more examples then. Um, what are use cases that you believe these types of spatial web and metaverse platforms? can be used for on a more day-to-day -day basis? Like how do you envision the average Joe using this technology in his everyday life or her everyday life? I mean, I always talk about this on LinkedIn, but I think a lot of what we're doing is more around impacting the change in consumer behavior more mm -hmm. than it is introducing new technology. Okay. Because as digital natives, we're already used to tapping into this new era of what it means to have a new product come in. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go as little back as the pay pass when you kind of uh, like apple pay i don't know in australia we call it pay pass it's, oh, okay. it's when you have your credit card and then you can just tap it yeah. and you pay right. um yeah so i don't I'm, i can't keep up with what everyone calls things <laughs> so you know if we go back to that or even if we go just as simple as when the apple launched the ipod or even the iphone mm -hmm. the biggest change wasn't the technology it was more how humans accepted it and right. how we interacted Interact. with it mm. so for me the use cases are pretty broad i mean we are tapping into luxury quite a lot because luxury seems to be one of the biggest movers in the space right now mm. why do you w think that is uh just the way that it's positioned itself i believe a lot of luxury brands kind of understood that it was a matter of survival to kind of tap into what the users want there's a big shift in the creator economy right now yeah. which means that you know previously creators dependent on brands to kind of have a name for themselves or to either work with them as ambassadors or influencers whereas now we're seeing a big shift to these creators are now able to build their own brand and be in a position where they can tap into right. <laughs> the luxury brands you know so we're seeing a big shift in just how humans themselves are positioning themselves based on their expertise and their skills. Um, so I think for luxury, it was just a matter of, okay, we need to survive how this movement is happening, you know? And the biggest way to do it was through tapping into the, the metaverse, tapping into NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, loyalty is pretty big now, you know? Um, yeah, I think that's a major use case for, for yeah. NFTs, the loyalty. We do quite a lot. Programs. We do quite a lot with loyalty right now. So we actually either build new loyalty programs for brands, or we mm -hmm. uplift the ones that they currently have okay. to help them um, bring in, you know, the metaverse NFTs. What it means to build a community around this new membership and Are experiences. Are there any companies or projects that you think have done a good job so far at that specifically? Loyalty. God, I don't want to get really controversial right now, but um, I think a lot of what's happening right now is still the unraveling of what a strategy is going to look like. If you were to ask me, I think there's been a lot of opportunities that could have been a hit, but somehow were a bit of a miss. And the reason for that is I believe a lot of, a lot of brands are trying to reinvent what it means to be in this space rather than actually staying true to their brand identity and just bringing this aspect into their day-to-day -day operations and their already existing brand. Um, Perhaps those that came in like for the hype, right? right? Like yeah, a lot of people. exactly what they were doing. A hundred percent. A lot of people jumped in for the hype. And, you know, I have one brand, which is it's a luxury brand. It's one of my favorites, actually. Which is? Uh, I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of my favorites. Uh, um, and they tried to enter the metaverse space. And to be honest, I think this was the first time where I got so angry over how it happened that I was extremely worked up. I was like, on, I remember being on Slack, like mm -hmm. profusely typing, like, I cannot believe this happened, blah, blah. On LinkedIn? No, on oh, Slack. On Slack, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on Slack, because what happened was they wanted to enter the space. Um, one of my favorite brands, I was within the target market that they wanted to approach, as in with what they were doing, mm -hmm. but they completely missed the mark because one, the marketing wasn't done at the level that they would have usually done had it not been the metaverse or NFT or Web3 focused. Um, 
the offering just wasn't at the level or the aesthetic that they would have normally had it. Okay. So for me, they kind of just that missed on these key points and it, it really upset me. So this is why I guess you could say when we work with a client or with a luxury brand, mm. we always make sure that we tell their story and just infuse the metaverse and AI and VR and AR and any immersive experience that we're doing to their brand right. while building a sub brand for them that they can tap into. So. I hope that answered your question, but you know, luxury is pretty big. Uh, you, we have a lot around health and wellness Okay. as well. We do quite a lot with health and wellness. How, um, like, can I get another example of how metaverse technology yeah, is I mean, used for that? Yeah, I mean, recently, uh, and again, I shared this on LinkedIn, we had the, a research group, I believe it was Kobe University, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember the name of the university, but what they did is they looked at rats and they did a VR simulation and they were able to tell which rats had autism and which rats oh. didn't just through the way that they were kind of transmitting their neurological um, kind of when they would see an image through yeah. a VR, you could tell, you know, how they were kind of really reacting to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. If anyone wants to read up on it, just go to my LinkedIn. I have it all there. But um, we do quite a lot when it comes to anxiety treatment. Mm. So helping people with fear of heights, uh, fear of um, um, what do you call it? Public speaking, fear of That's uh, all psychological. claustrophobia. Yeah, but when you infuse VR into it, you're able to support the user. I'm oh, sorry, I keep saying the user. You're able to support the individual by monitoring their heart rate and giving them the ability to see what's happening. Oh, so okay. what we do is we connect the iWatch or any kind of uh, smartwatch. Um, smartwatch that they have, and we monitor their breathing and their heart rate. So then we're in a position where we can say to them, okay, this is how you reacted initially. And with these breathing techniques, this is what happened. Okay, so that's using VR technology. Yeah. It's not the same thing as metaverse technology. Well, metaverse, again, <laughs> <laughs> metaverse technology is, this is what I mean by spatial web, right? right because okay. the metaverse, again, everyone has their own definition, but for us, the metaverse is the metaverse as a service. It's the 3D access and engagement point of how people enter, engage and interact and do all the things that they want. But the added layers that we're calling spatial web is the VR experience, the AR experience, oh, okay. how okay. AI plays a part, how crypto plays a part, right. how tokens play a part. So we're trying to split the two, I guess you could say. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Did you see um, the Lex Friedman interview yeah, with did. Mark Zuckerberg yeah. and their Kodak avatars? Yeah. What did you think about that? I thought it was really cool. I would love to do like an interview like that myself if, if I'm not able to do it in person like this. But do you think that that could be a reality soon for more than just people at Meta? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the technology already exists. Internally, we can already do that. Right, um, right. But I mean, in terms of adoption. In terms of adoption, again, it just comes down to the adoption rate. You still have people who don't really believe in the space right now or what's happening. You know, NFTs at one point were like worth millions of dollars. Now they're back at zero yeah. you know the metaverse hype cycle went up 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 and you had people buying land on the central land and sandbox for like millions of dollars and now it's again worth little to to nothing mm -hmm. so i believe mass adoption really just comes from what is the use case right. you know the, the use case kind of needs to push that do i think everyone now is ready to have a vr headset and do that i definitely don't think so no <laughs> but i think we're slowly trying or starting to make progress in how people accept what's being put out into the market. Okay, well, we're running out of time. So if you could just tell the audience what's the best way to get in touch with you, learn more about MetaMind, Zilliqa, yep. best way to reach out to you. So I guess the best way to connect with me personally, honestly, would be on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. So just look up Sandra Hillu and it should come up. It's the same headshot I've used everywhere. So you can't, <laughs> you can't confuse it at all. Um, or you can check out our website, which is www.metaminesgroup.com. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Renella. And everyone, please make sure to watch other episodes of Web3 Talks. If you enjoyed this one, give us a like, leave us a comment, and I'll see you all next time.